All right, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, welcome y'all, thanks for being here today. Um, I'm excited for the fifth part of this uh, climate action planning series. Uh, and today we're gonna be talking about the strategic integration of offsets into your decarbonization goals and climate action plan. So before we get started, just a couple logistics. The program is being recorded and we will also be posting it on YouTube and sending it out to folks afterwards. Um, and if you have questions, please put them throughout the, uh, the webinar and you're welcome to use the Q&A function or the chat. Uh, we'll have 15 minutes after all of the presentations. Uh, and just FYI, you're on mute mode uh, and then the panelists will be the only folks that will be able to speak. Um, so as I mentioned, this is the fifth webinar of a longer uh, series focused on how to complete a climate action plan. Uh, we have um, six more uh, that will be happening up until our summit, which is uh, in February, uh, located in Washington, D.C. So if you're interested in what those uh, the rest of the webinars are, that information is on our website. Uh, and so as I mentioned, we have our summit coming up in uh, 2025 in February, located in Washington, D.C. And if you're interested in that, uh, just go to higheredclimatesummit.org to find more information. We also have a couple working groups that uh, we wanted to highlight here before we uh, jumped off into the content for today. Uh, the first one is the Intersect Intersectional Climate Action Leaders Working Group. And this is a BIPOC affinity space led by our colleague Blythe. Uh, and it is intended for HBCU, MSI, and Tribal Climate, Tribal College Climate Action Stakeholders, Community, NGO, and Corporate Partners. Uh, and if you're interested in that, uh, please email Blythe or you're welcome to scan the QR code. Uh, it's a community space uh, meant to catalyze cross-institutional collaborations with a deeper nuanced cultural responsive and understanding of institutional needs, advancing peer mentorship and climate action resilience planning, best practice sharing and other related opportunities. So um, please, if you're interested in that, either scan the QR code or reach out to Blythe. And the other one we have upcoming is our, our IRA community of practice. Uh, and so you're in, if you're interested in that, please scan this code. Uh, I think we are hoping to launch that within the next month or so. Um, and so if you have any questions, you're welcome to ask me. Uh, uh, and if not, uh, just scan the code. I think it's a pretty simple form. So today, really, uh, as I mentioned, we're going to be talking about offsets broadly, uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit more specifically. So before I hand it off to Meredith, who will be our first speaker, we really just wanted to get an understanding of who's in the room. So I am going to launch a poll and keep it open for a couple minutes. Uh, and so if y'all could help us out with just understanding who's here and so the panelists understand a little bit more about the audience. And so I'll keep this open for just a few minutes.
Okay, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll and then um, we'll share it with folks so we can know a little bit more about who's here. Um, so it looks like we have quite a bit of sustainability staff um, located in facilities and operations, a couple uh, from academic affairs, uh, someone from student affairs, and then a couple non-university attendees. Um, most people around 80% have a neutrality goal. Uh, and then for the people that do have a neutrality goal, a lot of them are just beginning. Uh, and then for folks also that do have a goal, um, most of them are including all of the scopes. And then lastly, it seems like we have a pretty good mix of beginners, intermediate, and advanced understanding of offsets and its markets. So this is really helpful for us to know, um, just so the panelists can understand a little bit more about who's here. So um, I'll ask our panelists to come on screen and I'm just gonna do a, a brief introduction and then I'll hand it over to our first panelist, which is Meredith. Um, so just for a, a brief hello for the, the panelists broadly, we have Meredith Lee, who's the Climate Programs Manager for Focus on Member Engagement with Second Nature. Uh, we have Aaron Dernbaugh, who is from Loyola University, Chicago. He's the Director of Sustainability. And then we have Emma Fulop, who is the Sustainability Operations Manager for Duke University. So um, we're gonna go in the order of Meredith will start and then we'll hand it over to Aaron and then to Emma. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand it off to Meredith and I'm gonna read your bio. Uh, so as Member Engagement Manager, Meredith provides support and strategy for member services across Second Nature's programming. Meredith supports the UC3 Coalition and facilitates other stakeholder groups and will work with Second Nature with the Second Nature team to recruit campus climate leaders, champion op optimal network impact, and center the member experience. Meredith has worked in sustainability for over 20 years with a specialty in land and food. Before her work with Second Nature, she was a freelance writer, writer and independent consultant for support supporting communities, NGOs, and businesses to empower climate smart resilient food systems. She's the co-owner of the Fermentation School, an online education platform for learning culinary fermentation skills. And she also is a co-founder of Carbon Harvest, a company developing regional scale, regional scale carbon offset platforms focused on agroforestry. So thanks for being here, Meredith, and I'll pass it over to you. Thanks so much, Cami. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, Prior to my role, I'll add there, prior to my role as member engagement manager at Second Nature, I was in a year long fellowship as a carbon offsets fellow with Second Nature. So a lot of the work that we've done around offsets is um, presently being updated based on heavy amount of research and networking and listening um, in the carbon offset space and the carbon offsets higher education space over the last year. So that's sort of what gives me any authority to be here whatsoever. Um, talking to you, um, higher education experts about this, um, but for the beginners in the room, we wanted to kick off with a little bit of 101. Um, so making sure that we are sharing vocabulary around what we're talking about when we talk about offsets and also just the terms that we are most likely to use because there is quite a glossary of terms when it comes to talking about offsets. Um, so to be very clear, carbon offsets are tradable instruments that represent metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent either avoided or removed. Um, and so to be super specific, they are a funding mechanism um, for climate mitigation. And we'll get into how that kind of works in the next slide. Um, but basically, presently, one of the only funding mechanisms for um, trying to finance climate mitigation. Um, however, they are heavily flawed, which I'm sure we'll also get into. Um, so higher education institutions can be sellers or buyers of carbon offsets. Um, many are both. Um, and then offsets are bought and sold in different kinds of markets. Um, there are compliance markets um, like the California Air Resources Board and the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, CARB or REGI, respectively. Um, but mostly we're going to be focusing today on the voluntary market, which is um, yeah, abbreviated as the VCM. So if you hear the term VCM, that's what we're talking about. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so drilling down kind of into VCM and how it works for those that aren't familiar, 
Um, basically, there are protocols. Um, these are documents that dictate the methodologies for mitigation projects to produce and monitor the offsets that they produce. Um, and these protocols are, you know, based in science, ideally, and they are administered by um, carbon offset registries. Um, then, so projects that are developed to kind of, uh, I guess, produce offsets in, for the market, they have to be developed according to those methodologies. They're then registered um, with the registry that um, as an oversight body, overseeing body, so the big registries you've heard of are VERA, the gold standard, um, American Carbon Registry. Um, these are you know, some of the big, the big ones. Um, so then after that, the projects seek validations via entities known as validation verification bodies or VVBs. These are third party ISO accredited consulting firms usually that can review all of the data associated with the project um, in order to determine that the offsets are real. Um, and then, so via that validation, projects, you know, then produce, are then I guess certified to produce offsets. And then they seek verification of those offset credits. Um, credits are typically, or an issuance is another way of describing them, is equivalent to one metric ton of carbon dioxide avoided or removed. And that verification process happens via the ver validation verification bodies again. Uh, then the credits are issued by the registry um, and then only after that can the issuances or credits be sold um, to an entity as a way of offsetting their own greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and then that entity needs to retire them usually so that they cannot be double counted um, by another entity. Next slide. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that goes into this, obviously, um, and we don't have time to get into all of the different vicissitudes of offsets on the voluntary market. But this is just a brief overview of all the things that need to come into account when an institution is considering buying offsets or selling offsets. Um, so there are sort of universally agreed upon principles of offset integrity. Um, many of our members are familiar with the PAVER acronym, which is, um, you know, kind of being folded in, in our work, being folded into the ICVCM's core carbon principles. These are sort of the, the core carbon principles are sort of the latest principles for offset integrity. And they're all listed here in the dark blue box. Um, the, so effective governance, tracking, transparency, independent third party verification, additionality, permanence, blah, 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 all that stuff. And we don't have time really to go over the definitions of each one of those, but for any attendee here that is interested in um, the definitions, I invite you to visit the ICVCM's Core Carbon Principles webpage and you will see a definition of that of them there. Um, but this really gets into the nitty gritty of what makes um, offsets you know, good or bad. I think that, <laughs> It's important not to get into a lot of binary when we get into these spaces because there's a ton of nuance to all kinds of offset projects and there's really no perfect offset as I'm sure our, our other panelists will share. Um, they discovered or are highly familiar with after their journey to um, procure offsets of the highest integrity possible. Um, the other obvious um, indica or indication of all these projects is climate justice. Um, some people can include climate justice in co-benefits, which are just like all the other reasons to do an offset project besides just the greenhouse gas, you know, mitigation potential. Um, but we like to pull it out at Second Nature because there are some pretty, um, yeah, important social, economic, environmental, you know, benefits or negative impacts of offset projects and the ways that they're developed and designed have bearing on those impacts. And so it's really important for institutions to pay close attention to equity considerations when looking into carbon offset projects, even if the you know listed co-benefits that are standard for that project, um, sometimes they tend to eclipse or overlook some of the justice implications of carbon offset projects. And then, you know, um, co-benefits, you know, for higher education, it's not just like, what are the other environmental co-benefits of these projects or what are the other economic, uh, is there job creation, but also the educational co-benefits of projects. Um, so I think we'll hear about some of that going on um, in, the, in the discussion today, which is really exciting. 
um, because there is, um, as we mentioned, many problems with carbon offsets and higher education institutions have assets, not only the research enterprise, but also um, you know, teaching and, and, and curriculum development that can help students become leaders in the future offset market. We, it shows really no sign of, of stopping <laughs> despite its problems right now. So what we really need is to be training the next generation of folks to be thinking critically and leading, um, yeah, be on the leading edge of making the offset markets better. Um, and the last thing I'll mention is that we really recommend, if possible, engagement with projects that institutions are in, are investing in or considering investing in to the extent possible. This isn't always possible, especially if you're working with a broker, um, but obviously the more um, relational um, your engagement with a project can be, then the more, the better you can feel about it, um, usually. Um, so I think that's, that's, I guess, most of what I'm going to say. A lot of what we can offer, I guess, through our guidances are um, kind of what we know, according to the best science, at the project type level. So, but when it comes down to specific projects, there's a lot of nuance. So again, the deeper engagement you have, the more due diligence you can perform. Um, yeah, more specific due diligence you can perform. Next slide, please. Um, so just a brief overview of the offset resources that Second Nature provides. Um, I am the contact person for all of these things. So you can see my email at the bottom of the slide. I'm not gonna go into these offerings deeply, but I wanna list them so you know what's happening and you can get engaged if you are not already. Um, so the culmination of the fellowship that I did with Second Nature last year and all the research into um, the carbon offset market and corporate ESG and doing a lot of deep listening with our campuses um, is a, this third version of our carbon markets and offsets guidance. Um, and that is something that we are putting the finishing touches on now. We're having a lot of our campuses review it. And then we're hoping to publish it by the end of 2024, if not very early 2025. So that's very exciting. And the idea with the offsets guidance is not just to familiarize and overview carbon markets and offsets for um, higher education institutions, but also to provide um, really up-to-date guidance on how to use offsets responsibly within an overall decarbonization um, ambition. Um, so uh, we're also updating the climate commitments, um, what we're calling Commitments 3.0. And so this guidance is really um, kind of helping us along in that process and mirroring that process of really updating what is best practice for higher education institutions when it comes to climate action right now. Um, the Carbon Offsets Advisory Council is a working group that I facilitate that has been instrumental in shaping that guidance. Um, it's been operational for 18, 19 months at this point. Um, and you know, if you're interested in joining, we have an incredible archive of our meetings and our notes um, and would love to have more voices all the time and more perspectives. Um, we also maintain two programs that are specific to carbon offsets, the Carbon Credit and Purchasing Program, or otherwise known as C2P2, which is um, there for supporting campuses who want to develop offset projects according to the campus-wide campus -wide clean energy and efficiency methodology. It's a specific methodology through VERA that allows campuses to develop offsets um, according to a suite of energy efficiency measures um, or lead building retrofits or construction. Um, so reach out to me if you're interested in that. And then we also have the Offsets Lab, formerly known as the Offset Network, which is sort of our container for um, transdisciplinary research around offsets. And also um, we developed with member campuses and academics over the years, the policies and processes for peer reviewed offsets where higher education campuses can develop projects and then peer review, have another institution peer review those projects as a learning tool, a teaching tool, and a way, you know, most often to offset scope three emissions. Um, so again, if you're interested in any of those um, opportunities, please reach out to me. I'd be happy to give you more information. And um, that kind of concludes my overview. I'll give it back to you, Cami. Thanks so much, Meredith. Okay, so we're gonna hand it over to Aaron now. Um, so Aaron Dernbaugh, Aaron Noble Dernbaugh, Director of Sustainability at Loyola University Chicago supports the students, faculty, and staff around Loyola 
Loyola's campuses and academic centers in creating the most sustainable and transformative education experience possible. The Office of Sustainability works across the curriculum, um, across the curriculum culture and campuses of Loyola to build innovation and efficiency into the university's programs and student experience focusing on climate action, water protection, and mission-driven social justice. Loyola has been consistently recognized as a leader in higher ed and in the Chicago region for their work to address climate change and mission-aligned align, mission sustainability efforts. Welcome, Erin. I will hand it over to you. Thank, thanks so much, Cami, and thanks, Meredith, for that introduction. Uh, it's great to see so many names I don't recognize in the attendees list. Uh, so glad you're with us um, today, wherever you're located. Hopefully fall is uh, meeting you well. Um, we can just go to the next slide. This is just sort of a start and I'll give an introduction to Loyola. Loyola is based, of course, in Chicago. We're Loyola University of Chicago. There's a few Loyolas out there. Um, and we have three main campuses in the Chicago land area, two in the city proper and one just outside the city, our health science campus. We also have two academic centers in the suburbs and then one uh, that we're sort of famously known for on the foothills just up from the, from, um, the Vatican in Rome. Uh, next slide. Uh, you know, we... I, I, talk about our climate action plan quite a lot. We adopted this in 2015 with a goal of carbon neutral for scopes one and two by 2025. Um, I had to go back to our climate action plan to see what we actually said about offsets. Uh, I couldn't really remember how we had phased it. So in the yellow box here is actually what we have listed as our strategy. Um, so it was under sort of a subcategory of renewable energy, purchase carbon offsets annually for scopes one, two, and three, no annual savings. It would have been done between fiscal year 2016 and 2020, which of course it did not meet that timeline as you'll hear in a second. And it would be owned by facilities and budget, which is who owns it? So that's terrific. So next slide. We're doing okay towards that goal. Um, if you squint, I think this chart looks a little bit like uh, the that graphic I showed a second ago, um, which is also down in the bottom left corner of this slide. Uh, you can see scopes one and two, the green and the sort of um, pinky color getting smaller. And then even with an increase in um, square footage and student population, which is what those lines show. Um, you know, we're, we're on track. We're currently wrapping up our FY24 greenhouse gas, greenhouse gas inventory. And I know we're, we're getting towards those targets. Let me just mention very quickly how we're getting there. Next slide. Um, we've been working, uh, we, we knew we weren't going to be completely decarbonized by 2025, and we really use that first climate action plan as a chance to try out different technologies, transition some important systems, and now what we've been working on is a decarbonization strategy, um, really looking, as you can see, from 24 to 2045 on um, how we're going to decarbonize all these uh, thermal loads, all these heating loads. So these are just some graphics from this document. This plan's not available yet, but it's what we're working on and trying to integrate into our next 10-year capital plan. Next slide, please. What I think the decarbonization plan will finalize will be sort of five-year steps, um, which you can see here in these pages. These are not final at all, but you'll see different buildings and different systems being decarbonized by adopting the policies that you see listed here on the left-hand side. This is all very draft. It hasn't been formally adopted yet by Loyola, but this is what we've been wrestling with to sort of lay out what our next climate action plan will address. Next slide, please. Um, but we're certainly doing the work. Uh, we have a couple large geothermal systems in uh, in a slide or two. You'll see some of the other things we've we've addressed to decarbonize. But uh, here's just a picture from this summer. This is out my window. Um, that's beautiful Lake Michigan in the background. And that's a drilling rig at work, putting one of the 22 wells in that is going to serve that building that you can kind of see there on the left. And then, which is sort of a historic mansion building on campus, and then a new building that'll be built to the south of this location. So, um, so we're doing the work. Uh, and, and I can just say, um, from being up to my neck in Inflation Reduction Act, there's terrific opportunities out there for all kinds of clean energy, including things like geothermal or other heat recovery projects. Next slide. Uh, we also announced a couple years ago, signing on to a big offsite 
power purchase agreement. Um, this is done in a what's called a sleeved retail agreement with Constellation. Um, I won't get into the full details here. This isn't a clean energy procurement presentation, but um, you can see some of it on this slide. And these slides will can be shared and available. Uh, one thing I will highlight is we have this that you sort of see in maroon on the far left is this great educational side agreement we're really proud of. We're, we're really looking forward to opening up opportunities for our students. Next slide. Um, so when you step away from the projects and, uh, you know, what's different about us is that we're campuses um, and we have systems and, you know, interconnected buildings and lots of maybe small projects that in the, in the individual aren't much, but in the, in the aggregate are. Um, so I sort of look at it this way. We've, we've been able to reduce our therms by 25% per square foot. We've been able to reduce electricity by 18%. This is looking 2010 to um, an average of 2010 to 2012 compared to FY24. Um, the grid has gotten quite a bit less carbon intensive. So you see a big drop there. When we then move all of our electricity into clean power, we see a big drop there. And then, of course, then we need to address that um, maroon block that's left in the fourth bar, which is, of course, what we're talking about here with carbon offsets. Next slide. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on each of these slides because this is, I think, what everyone's here for, the sort of process that we went through to get to our carbon offset procurement. Um, we realized that we were decarbonizing. We were looking at our energy use on campus. We'd been deep in energy efficiency, looking at clean energy opportunities. Um, we're very urban, so we didn't have too many on campus, although we're still open to that. Um, so we created an ad hoc working group. Um, you can see some of the different offices that were represented, uh, School of Business, School of Environmental Sustainability, Purchasing Department, Facilities Department, Academic Affairs. And then we had student representatives um, from some of those same schools and some that are representative. They're on our student government bodies like that. And we got together in a couple meetings and really helped them understand. So those terms that Meredith was talking about, make sure they were somewhat literate in carbon markets, but also sort of run them through some exercises on some of the trade-offs so that when we got into a purchasing position, we sort of knew what was valuable to these stakeholders at Loyola. I don't think it's really that helpful to have sort of a generic sort of survey to your full community, but if you can get folks who are sort of clued in to how these markets might work, or some of the values or attributes that are demonstrated in some of these projects, I think you can actually get some really useful feedback, which then becomes really motivational as you get into some of the hard <laughs> challenges of making decisions. Um, this is just some examples here on the left where you see we did some exercises where we add, asked them to weigh sort of different attributes of projects or some gave them some different scenarios and said, okay, it's this kind of project or that kind of project, where would you put your dollars? This is just sort of um, some examples. If anybody wants more details, I'm happy to share, you know, back that was a couple of years ago and in, in fall of 21 into spring of 22 that we did this work. But what we ended up developing from this was a set of what we called purchasing guidelines, um, which sort of helped Loyola think about, helped us think about, okay, these are the kinds of projects, the kinds of priorities that our stakeholders would like to see valued. Um, next slide. We then took that. That's great to have a purchasing guideline, but it's very different when you actually go try to do procurement. And so we had four staff. So myself, another person from our sustainability office, and two folks from uh, facilities, because it was going to be from their facilities utility budget that we'd pay for this, um, that sat down. We met with a, 10 brokers, five different project developers, and we really learned firsthand uh, through Zoom meetings and then uh, the group that we brought in for in-person discussions about, you know, what are the trade-offs here? What do these look like? I think we also got a real feel for some of the um, qualities of some of these brokers and are, is it purely a transaction, purely financial, and that's really all they are able to offer you? Or can we get into some of those uh, other sort of opportunities, whether it is co-benefits, whether it's educational opportunities and the like that Meredith mentioned. Um, I've listed here sort of the intro letter that I sent to these folks and then some of the questions that we asked them all to react to or respond to in their presentation. We then, um, you know, had set of options which we presented to our leadership. Um, and then we sort of in a you know collaborative way decided which we wanted to go for. Um, of course, then you still have to buy it. So you still have to go through some contractual work and some other things that take some time, but uh, eventually in spring of 2024 and into the summer, we were able to sort of finalize with our, our project developer and we made a procurement for the first year, but with a commitment to buying for three years. I think that's just a important note is that we made a multi-year commitment I think um, it's something to th keep in mind when you're thinking about offset purchasing um, that you may want to, uh, you know, 
not just do a one year piece. Doesn't mean you can't change to different developers, but I, I do think multi year commitments are are more meaningful, especially as you know it's not just like a one and done. You claim carbon neutrality and then you forget about it for the rest of whatever. Next slide. Um, so we di we just uh, landed on Tradewater. Tradewater is a refrigerant destruction company. Um, we are purchasing carbon offsets. We are offered both domestic and um, international credits that at the same rate. Um, I won't share the rate, but uh, just to say it's for everything in our scope one emissions uh, for this fiscal year. So this is FY25 that we're in, and we already purchased everything for FY25. So we have achieved carbon neutrality for this starting in this fiscal year um, with our 100% renewable energy credits on our scope two emissions. So um, the, uh, if I go to the next slide, I think, and you see some of the co-benefits and things listed there, but um, what I'm excited about was we also did an educational side agreement they're Chicago based. They're not too far from us. Um, we have a number of our students who have either graduated and worked with them or interned with them. And also we can do tours. They can come do guest lectures. They do come do guest lectures already. So there's some great advantages there. Um, and then uh, we've been sort of asking research questions. So I brought a group of faculty together to say what it might be research questions that we could ask that would help trade water. And you can see some of them listed there uh, from the vendor, that little list there. Um, next slide. I want to make sure I hit my lessons learned. Um, so it's important when you when you make a commitment. Um, this is a us doing a tour of the Trade Water facility here in the Chicago suburbs. Um, those are some of my interns, and actually the guy in the checkered shirt in the middle. He's one of our alumni who works there, and the guy in the far left, Farron, is one of my interns and currently works there. So, um, so once you put this commitment into a document, you know it's up to you to really define the solutions and keep everybody appraised of your progress. Um, we thought we were going to do portfolio approach. I think you'll hear a little bit more of a portfolio project approach uh, in a moment. But as we went through our procurement process, we really found that one vendor could give us what we needed. And so we went through with 100% scope one emissions through trade water. Um, we were initially interested in real vintage matching so that the year of the carbon reducing, eliminating uh, activity had to match our activity, you know, when we were producing those emissions. But I think that sort of idea sort of fell out throughout our process. Um, you know, we definitely wanted to keep in our process how not to be buying offset to avoid any other, you know, decarbonization activities. So we made that sort of a policy within the process, within the purchasing guideline and Plus, they're from really two separate budgets. Our utility budget never gets spent on energy efficiency or capital projects. And like, you know, and that's our utility budget that was paying for these offsets. So um, that's just something to, to value against. We also created some cost of carbon within our project design process, which we think also is really supportive of that. Um, I think it's really important to have this educational um, opportunity within this these deals. Um, we're a university, you know, first and foremost, so we need to really augment that. And um, I think what can be challenging is a challenge I'm facing right at this minute is how to communicate these things. We've got lots of things going on. We've got big solar farms. We've got meeting the goals of a first climate action plan. We've got a next climate action plan. We've got a decarbonization strategy and how it integrates with a capital plan. And we've got this carbon offset purchase. So how to communicate those things in a meaningful way is something I don't really understand how to do well and something I'm really thinking a lot about right now. Um, and I think that's probably where I'll, I'll end. I'll just throw sh jump through two more slides very quickly. Click on the next one. Um, we did ask some questions and we continue to ask questions. I know people are interested in how it connects to things like commuting, how it connects into air travel. We've been asking questions and exploring that. We don't have a strategy yet. I know other schools do and can speak to those, but I just wanna say this is some some work we've done. It's good when you are surveying or where you're collecting information to maybe ask, this is in our commuting survey of what's your willingness to pay for some offsets. So we've sort of looked at that. And I think if you click on the next slide, this is how I'm thinking about our next climate action plan, sort of, I call it CAP 2.0. Um, what might offsets look like when we get into more full scope three accounting? What might offsets look like with our decarbonization sort of um, uh, runway out into 2045? So um, these are some things I'm sort of wrestling with and hopefully you know we can share or talk about more in question and answer. I think I'm all done and I'm gonna hand it back to Cami. Thanks, Aaron. I know it was a, a lot of information very quickly, and you 
you did great. So um, I'm going to hand it over to Emma. Let me introduce her really quick. Uh, let's see. All right. So Emma Fulop is the uh, Sustainability Operation Manager within Duke University's Office of Climate and Sustainability. Emma develops strategic plans to reduce GHG emissions from university activities, improves sustainability indicators, and enhance data reporting. She supports campus partners in developing and implementing climate and sustainability initiatives that fall within operational focus areas including waste commuting and carbon offsets. Lastly, Emma, Emma facilitates the Office of Climate and Sustainability's incorporation of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion principles across all aspects of its work. Emma has a BS from Davidson College and a master's in environmental management from Duke University. Prior to joining the Sustainable Duke team in 2019, Emma worked in environmental advocacy and regional land convert, uh, conservation. And I'll hand it over to you. Awesome. Thank you, Cami, And thank you all for being here. Um, so yeah, I'm going to just uh, run kind of quickly through Duke's uh, carbon neutrality goal and then kind of speak more, um, more deeply about the carbon offsets that we um, are using towards that goal. Um, next slide. So this is just a kind of a brief overview of sustainability at Duke. So in 2007, we signed the American Colleges and Universities President's Climate Commitment um, through Second Nature and set a 2024 neutrality goal. Uh, in 2009, the university adopted its first climate action plan. And in the same year, they also established the Duke Carbon Offsets Initiative, which was an office um, focused solely initially on developing offset projects and researching them. And then it later transitioned to um, focusing on purchasing and evaluating carbon offsets. Um, this climate action plan was updated in 2019, and we're just um, announcing in eight days uh, that we've met our neutra neutrality goal of 2024. Um, so next slide. Um, just to quickly kind of run through what that neutrality goal includes. So we use an operational control methodology um, for our geographic bounds, and so include all um, university buildings. Um, we have an, uh, a campus, in, our main campus is in Durham, North Carolina. Um, we have another campus on the coast of North Carolina. The university also has um, the Duke University Health System associated with it, um, but it's the operations are distinct from the university, and so the hospital is not included in our bounds, um, but the academic buildings, um, the School of Nursing and School of Medicine are. Next slide. And so our missions boundary, we include uh, scope one, two, and three. Um, within scope three, we include uh, air travel for the university, employee commuting, solid waste, and transmission losses. Next slide. Uh, and so, yeah, this is our strategy that we've kind of been using since the beginning. And so it's our reduce, renew, offset paradigm. Um, we're really prioritizing on-campus reductions. Um, and then once we, you know, have kind of done that to the, um, as much as we can, as quickly as we can, we moved into looking into um, renewables and um, specifically investments in off-campus renewables um, because in North Carolina, there are uh, state regulations about what we can do on campus. Um, and so then only after we've kind of max, maxed out on reduce and renew did we look at uh, carbon offsets. And so we really, in our communication to our community, really tried to um, you know, explain that offsets were the la last resort and just um, a necessary means to kind of get to neutrality, especially with those scope three categories. Next slide. So these are our emissions um, from our baseline year to now. Um, 2007. And so we saw a 31% decrease in overall emissions from 2007. This occurred while the campus um, building footprint grew by 27% and population grew by 24%. Um, and so we're, we're really, really proud of this. Um, we had planned for, you can see in the, the far right, there's a 2025 solar project. Uh, we had planned for the solar project that's built in Western North Carolina to come online um, earlier so we could um, use it towards our neutrality um, in our neutrality year, but uh, that was just delayed due to uh, COVID and kind of supply chain disruptions. And so that's coming online next year. Um, and then that pie chart just shows the breakdown of all of the categories within our um, greenhouse gas accounting. Um, and so you can see, uh, yeah, that we have, you know, natural gas is about a third, purchase electricity is about a third, and then air travel and commuting make up the most of our scope three emissions. Next. So this digs a little bit more into um, those scope one and two emissions. So we actually saw 42% decrease since 2007. Um, this was due to a couple uh, key improvements. So we discontinued the use of coal on campus and moved solely to natural gas. 
Uh, we've done a lot of work increasing our building and plant efficiency. We're doing work to um, convert as many buildings as possible from steam to hot water. Um, and then Duke Energy, which is our utility, is also kind of doing work on their end to um, reduce the intensity of the grid. Next slide. This is not all scope three emissions, again, just transportation, because that's the largest um, percentage of those scope three emissions. And so this is uh, not as pretty of a story, but um, so an important one to tell. Um, during COVID, we saw a huge uh, decrease in all of all transportation emissions. It has since rebounded to just under 2007 levels. And so we're really kind of trying to think about how to um, capitalize on lessons learned during COVID and ensure these numbers don't keep going up. And so the university has instituted a flexible work policy. So folks who are able to can work from home, um, which really reduces our uh, commuting emissions. Um, we're looking into kind of education around air travel and you know, potentially establishing a, a sustainable funding mechanism of some kind to um, account for air travel emissions and put that money towards offsets or towards um, internal campus reductions. Next slide. And so, yeah, so we ultimately um, needed to offset 229,000 offsets this year to reach neutrality. Um, and we have been really working for a while uh, to get those offsets. So like I said, the Duke Carbon Offset Initiative was created in 2009 um, and was really focused on developing projects. And so we were developing a lot of small scale pilot projects in urban forestry. We had a swine waste to energy project we developed, um, but ultimately realized that our staff of two was not really going to be able to develop projects that could scale up to kind of what we expected our need to be um, for offsets by 2024. And so uh, a few years ago, we really pivoted to kind of that evaluation and purchasing mindset. Um, and so we created this uh, robust review process to kind of, um, yeah, create these, per do these purchases. And because we were involved in the offset market from a number of different roles, um, I think within the university, we're pretty aware of yeah the risks and the problems with um, with offsets, and so we really wanted to be able to um, establish what we consider high quality offsets, and to be able to distinguish what those high quality offsets were among the rest of the no of the noise in the offset market. Um, and so we created this iterative process to allow us to purchase um, a portfolio of, of offsets. Um, we went with a portfolio approach approach again to manage risk. Um, the more offset projects we have in there, you know, if something goes wrong with one, we still have others um, that we feel really good about. And so the first step of our process, we um, solicited projects directly from project developers through an RFP. Um, we only solicited about three to seven at a time um, because step two of this process is pretty intensive. Um, myself and my colleague went through all of the projects that we sourced and used um, their PDD and documents um, on the registries to go through this tool evaluation tool that we created. And so that was pretty time intensive. And at the time we were doing this projects, uh, project developers could really only hold price and quantity, could only guarantee them for about two to four weeks. So we had to move pretty quickly. Um, so we went through all of the projects um, and anything that we identified as high quality that scored highly through the tool, we brought um, to an advisory committee, which is made up of students, faculty, and staff. Um, a lot of these folks had, you know, some background in carbon offsets or some knowledge of carbon offsets, but a lot of them, their expertise was in things um, connected to carbon offsets. So forestry, um, finance, uh, natural resource financing, engineering, um, things like that. And so only about 10% of the projects really made it from step two to step three. Um, and then once we uh, kind of had identified um, the best projects out of from our advisory committee, uh, we brought those to our executive committee um, and then made final purchasing rec recommendations. And we went through this cycle numerous times um, to get that final portfolio. Next slide. So this is a screenshot of our evaluation tool. We created it with the help of Ruby Canyon, who is a verifier in the voluntary market um, and a consulting firm. So we met with them and kind of talked about our indicators of quality, and they helped us come up with um, some specific criteria and questions to ask as we reviewed all of the offset projects. And so our criteria is below, it really kind of matches that paver um, framework that Meredith was talking about. So additionality, transparency, permanence, leakage. Um, and we also had knockout criteria, which were kind of major red flags. And so if we saw those, we just stopped looking at the project. Um, we actually did not consider co-benefits. Um, in this evaluation tool, we were focused solely on the quality of the offset. Um, did it 
you know, sequester reduce one metric ton of CO2 that would have otherwise not have been. And that was really our focus. We saw co-benefits as extra to that. So great if they have it, but not something that we want to evaluate our projects on. Um, and in some cases, I can talk about this more, but we also, we kind of can see co-benefits as kind of muddying the waters of additionality. If um, a project will, you know, if there's recreational benefit, maybe those four, those trees wouldn't have been cut down um, for the recreational benefit, not for the carbon offset financing. Um, and so, yeah, we, so we just really wanted to take um, co-benefits out of the equation. We did have a knockout criteria um, looking at harm reduction and kind of that climate justice angle. And so if we saw any evidence of a project harming a community or if there are any, you know, like negative op-eds or press releases about it, um, if if the project um, took place in a community and there wasn't really clear that like the community wasn't brought into the process, we like asked additional questions. And so that is one, um, one thing outside of these other quality indicators that we included in the tool. Uh, next slide. And so this is the final portfolio that we came up with. Um, it is a good amount of ozone depleting uh, destruction credits also from trade water. Um, there's also some landfill gas destruction credits and livestock waste to energy. Uh, so you'll notice that actually they are all would be kind of considered industrial projects instead of natural resource projects. This was not on purpose, but I think was really due to the fact that we were not considering um, co-benefits. And so, um, yeah, industrial projects rose to the top for us. Um, we also, there are third-party ready firms that exist um, that kind of came online a few years ago. We have a, subscri a subscription to one that we use really to check our work. And so we're excited to say that 78% of our of our portfolio is rated A or A plus, um, which is kind of the highest ratings you can get. Although not all of the projects have currently been rated. Um, next slide. And so where do we go from here? So we've met neutrality. Um, we are currently working with a, an advisory committee to kind of establish a next generation goal, pushing ourselves to go further. Um, and so our plan is to establish a science-based target of net zero by 2050. We're going to have um, interim reduction goals um, on this, this timeline. These are just examples. Um, but interim, interim reduction goals to help us get to that net zero point. We're also expanding our geographic boundary to actually include the health system this time. And so that's going to be yeah a pretty big um, expansion. And ultimately, we're expecting by 2050 to have met our goal um, of net zero with 90% or more emission reductions. And so we're planning to only use offsets for about 5 to 10% um, of that total, of total emissions. Um, and I think, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Emma. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and if panelists wanna come on camera, we're gonna spend um, the next 10 minutes just for some Q and A. So for folks that have some, um, looks like somebody um, started to put one in the, uh, Q&A, but I also have some from registration. And then I also had one that came up when y'all were talking. So um, I'll probably couple them just so we can get through as many as possible. Um, so one of them says, we're considering starting offsets for study abroad travel only. Ways to incorporate institution-wide learning would be helpful. So that, and then one that I had was, I think the Aaron, you really talked about how you engaged your school of business and obviously Emma engaging the procurement office. Can you talk about what that relationship was like in the beginning? How did you kind of start that conversation? Um, just kind of getting from A to B if an, if an office, a sustainability office is thinking about using offsets, how do they really start to place the, um, you know, the, the little seeds that you want to move forward? So I'll kind of open it. We'll start it there and then move forward. Emma, do you want to jump in or do you want me to? I'm going to jump in. Um, yeah. So for procurement, I think um, we, yeah. So uh, we had to do a lot of education with our procurement office because offsets are a weird thing to purchase. It's an intangible credit that's a serial number. And so we really had to kind of explain what an offset is, what it is we were actually purchasing and kind of why it was different from typical university purchasing kind of, um, yeah, just do that education. Um, and a lot, and yeah, we really needed, uh, 
it was hard to kind of get through the process, I think, just because of our timing constraints. Um, oftentimes in university, you know, it's, yeah, it can take its time. It can do a little more um, negotiations. And that wasn't really something that we were able to do with our time frame. And so, um, yeah, that education was just really important and finding those folks in procurement who um, understood what we were trying to do. And kind of, um, we've worked with procurement before to kind of do some, you know, environmental um, environmental purchasing um, for like flooring and um, paint. And so just um, taking that history and just kind of bringing it to um, a different type of, of purchasing need. And I'll just say as far as how we sort of created our our team in in two phases was um you know i kind of keep track on who's involved and what faculty or have what sustainability strengths as as much as i can and then when i have a a need like this i sort of pull together these ad hoc um committees for short times i also we have a university sustainability committee so i got their permission in the first place to go create this purchasing guideline and then offered, you know, do you know somebody? And, you know, one of our members was the interim Dean for the school of business at that time. So he offered some names and, you know, sort of pull it together the way you can. But I think, you know, the process and everybody, you know, if you're a beginner here listening, you're st at that stage, but if you're more advanced, don't discount the time that you'll need to spend um, sort of just sharing information about, this this field it's changing all the time and you want to kind of create a community of shared learning um around the topics as much as you can even if they're not suddenly going to pivot their research <laughs> to align with this work um they get to go at their next cocktail party and be a little bit more of an expert uh, around the offsets and and maybe be less or be a more informed skeptic um around the offset marketplace Thank you. And then um, for the person that had asked about their offsets for study abroad uh, traveling, I, the question I think really is around how, around how to incorporate incorporate institution wide learning. So, is there a way that you felt like you have done that well? Were there any lessons learned? <laughs> Aaron's like, no. <laughs> no. So we had a grad student in our international um, office who was really hot on this topic pre-COVID. And so he and one of my in grad interns actually put together um, a proposal for air travel offsets, which was great, really well developed. It was moving through the chain uh, and then COVID hit and it's really been put on a bookshelf ever since. So we have not, we, we had a strategy for the way it was going to be in, integrated into the application process for study abroad. Um, so that's specifically to study abroad. We do, I won't even speak about business air travel because it's such an imperfect solution that we have right now um, that I think there's a lot of schools that are doing it better. I, I think Maryland, I think there might be something in the Penn State system, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, Emma, you might know some of the others who have done things related to air travel, both business air travel or study abroad air travel, more advanced than what we've accomplished. Yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, UPenn has um, done a sustainable purchasing um, program for air travel. Um, but I was gonna, yeah, also just add to the education piece. Um, we don't yet yeah, include student study abroad. And so um, haven't had to do education on that side, but just generally education about offsets has been pretty difficult. It's, you know, really easy to reach the students who are already engaged and interested in these subject areas, the students doing environmental studies, energy policy. Um, and so, but students who aren't interested um, in that space, it's a lot harder to, to get them and to get their attention. And so we've just been really trying to um, get into classes to find the, those faculty that, um, you know, are interested and can make a connection to carbon offsets, yeah, to business, to engineering, to um, these other spaces, and just really trying to, to offer ourselves as a resource um, for those classes to, to reach more students um, than we otherwise could. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm going to, I'll ask Meredith this first, since Meredith, you've been kind of in the broader world of offsets. Um, but can you talk about just some of the misconceptions you feel like you've heard and throughout your learning process? Because I know you came on not, you know, being super focused in the work and then have kind of had more of an arch of, you know, being more knowledgeable than the, you know, than the we'll say regular or normal person right around offset. So what are some misconceptions you feel like you've heard and that you've kind of learned through? And then I'll pass that also to um, Aaron and Emma. 
Hmm. I mean, I guess I would say the biggest misconception is that like offsets are one thing, right? Like <clears throat> offsets are all good or offsets are all bad. Like that's, that's the misconception. Like if we take some kind of blanket understanding of offsets and run with it and like, um, that's the part I think that just gets, that makes it even harder. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, because offsets aren't all good or all bad. Um, and they are, um, there's a lot of nuance. There's a lot of, co of complexity. And so I think it's a really a lean in sort of thing. And I think I put this in, in response to the air travel question, like sometimes offsets and their controversy and the misconception around them is a great way to begin education about how we actually start to internalize the cost of our emissions. Um, and I think one of the problems with that is that the market price of offsets is really, it tends to be lower than the true cost of, of emitting carbon. And so, you know, you could also start it from a conversation about carbon pricing to say, what is the price that our university places on carbon? Are we willing to put the social cost of carbon onto emissions? And then you might find yourself escalating very quickly towards a conversation about offsets because, for example, you might not have the budget to really truly value your emissions at their true cost. And so I think there's, I guess I just wanted to share that that's like, think about that. Think about how to start the conversation. Sometimes starting with offsets is the right way, but sometimes backing up and trying to create an internal carbon pricing strategy is a better way to, yeah, um, appeal to whoever your stakeholders might be and their concern might be. I totally agree with that. Meredith, thanks for sharing that. Uh, I put something in the chat, which I just found interesting because I think some people, and there are certainly buyers who do this, who do offsets in lieu of decarbonization, but there was a great study by Ecosystem Marketplace that sort of looked at that question and looked at the actual decarbonization that these buyers were doing. And they were more aggressive in real decarbonization, not in goal setting or target setting, but in actual emissions reductions than non-offset purchasers um, that may have been <laughs> debunked <laughs> since it was published. But I, I found that to be compelling and something I've shared around that it, it actually, I think that's maybe a misconception that's out there um, that maybe has either been debunked or at least is being discussed and debated actively. So, and I'll, oh yeah, I'll quickly just say, I think um, a misconception is, um, yeah, maybe that all offsets are, well, I don't know, maybe this isn't a misconception, but um, all offsets are not created equal. You know, I think a lot of people who are pro offsets say there's registries, there's rules and regulations, there's verification. And so, um, all offsets that go through that process are good offsets, um, but those rules and regulations can be pretty squishy. There's people who, you know, follow the letter of the law, but not the spirit of the law. It's a market. So there's people who are um, in it, maybe not for the same reasons that we're in it. And so um, all that to say is, even though it is great that there are these systems in place, I think it is on the purchaser to really dig in and ensure that you're understanding what you're purchasing and kind of um, how those offsets were created. Great. Thanks, y'all. I think that's really helpful. And kind of folds into why the integrity of the offset is extremely important and understanding that thoroughly is, is part of it. So, um, well, I think we're at time. So I really appreciate uh, you guys being here, Emma, Aaron, and Meredith. Um, and for folks that um, are curious, I'm going to share my screen one more time. Uh, I know we had the um, eat their emails up. Actually, I might not because my, oh, here we go. Um, in case folks want to reach out to uh, our panelists, just so um, they, uh, in, in case you have any specific questions. And so I'll just share this momentarily and then we'll end for the day. Um, so again, we really appreciate everyone being here. And if you have anything specific, uh, specifically for the panelists, reach out, or I am also available for questions. So thanks everyone. And we hope you have a good day.